All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and welcome to the four o'clock um, event of today's really amazing program here at the Granoff Center for Creative Arts at Brown University. Um, I'd like to welcome both the members of the audience who are here corporeally um, with us today and everyone who's joining um, virtually. This is part of the Reexamining Conservation uh, Exhibition and Symposium, which is presented by the Brown Arts Institute and the Creature Conserve. And this symposium features Brown faculty and students, as well as a stellar lineup of guests. And the complete schedule can be found um, on the digital program that's on the Creature Conserve's website, which you can get to um, by scanning the QR code that's posted um, on the entrances to the auditorium. My name is Bathsheba Demuth, and I'm an assistant professor of history and environment and society here at Brown University, um, where I specialize in the lands and seas of the Russian and North American Arctic. I would highly recommend, um, and this is a little bit of me um, asking you to do as I say and not as I have yet done, um, but I intend to, uh, to spend some time um, over the coming days and weeks um, exploring Creature Conserve's Biennial Art Exhibition, uh, which is up here in the Granoff, um, is on the theme of re-examining conservation, questions at the intersection of the arts and sciences. And it also includes, in addition to the Cohen and Atrium galleries, which are filled with um, visual and installation pieces, a beautifully curated reading room on level two of this Granoff building, and the exhibition is free and open to the public and will be up until the 10th of June. So I will have time to actually go see it. We're also delighted to be partnering with the Brown Bookstore, which is carrying titles by many of the speakers and presenters and other participants um, in this exhibition. And the bookstore is offering 20% off on uh, purchases of titles uh, now through Saturday, April 23rd. Um, so run over to the bookstore afterwards if you need some reading for this sunny weekend. I would most especially like to thank um, the many people who were required to make this afternoon's event possible um, and all of the events in this series, especially uh, Talia Field, who unfortunately can't be with us, um, but as the faculty director of the Browns Art Institute really led off uh, the organization of this symposium, the staff at the Brown Arts Institute, the Creature Conserve team helmed by Dr. Lucy Spellman, the Animal Studies Group at Brown, uh, many of whom are presenting today, uh, and to the Tomagok Museum's Indigenous Empowerment Network, who have been working in conjunction with the Creature Conserve um, on this exhibition to further efforts uh, to amplify the vo voices of Rhode Island's indigenous communities. So as I mentioned, I'm a historian, an environmental historian, who spends most of my time um, when I'm not in Rhode Island um, in parts of the North American and Russian Arctic. And what I wanna do today uh, is visit the past of one of these northern places, um, the Chukchi Peninsula, which on this map um, is the, the piece that's kind of sticking out um, almost to touch the Seward Peninsula in Alaska at the Bering Strait. To give you a perspective of how far east this is in Russia, the Chukchi Peninsula is closer to where we are in Providence than it is to Moscow. It's a very long country. And several years ago, I was traveling north um, on a road in Chukotka toward where the Chukchi reindeer brigades run their herds along the Amguam River, um, which is in Russian now called the Amguema. And I was traveling with a young Chukchi man named Alex, um, who has distant relatives in the village of Amguema, and we were bringing them gifts for an upcoming celebration. Biscuits, sugar, candles, bread, tinned butter, evaporated milk, and bags of candies. One strange part of being a historian, and perhaps particularly of being an environmental historian, is that you often come to places and landscapes that you already know in some form through the archives. I had never visited this part of Chukotka before physically, but I had walked there the way that we do in our profession, in the company of the dead. And what the dead had told me about this part of the Chukchi Peninsula along the Bering Sea was to pack warm. In Vladivostok archives, I had read about August snow squalls, and in Moscow, about ice that would form on still water by early September. But I was not even wearing a sweater. In this part of the Arctic, 
2018 was the hottest summer in recorded memory. All through June and July, people said offhand or with worry or with a very dark humor that it was the end of the world or it was Armageddon. These conversations were part of a larger trend. The first word of what is, I believe, still the most widely read article about climate change to date, written by David Wallace Wells, is Doomsday. Scholars working on theories of societal collapse, from Joseph Tainter to Peter Turchin to Jared Diamond, offer grim takes on the general state of the world. Even the tenor of much climate history, with some very notable exceptions, give a dubious view of societal responses to past perturbations in the climate. Which is grim news, given that just a few weeks after I returned from Russia in 2018, scientists at the IPCC gave the world 12 years to reduce carbon emissions or risk warming so great that it was headlined as climate apocalypse. That number of years is, of course, down to less than nine. The foreboding is so intense that climate change has become the background moral dread to some of our fiction, from Jenny Offel's novel Weather to Christine Smallwood's academic satire, Life of the Mind, both of which pit daily life against the looming shadow of catastrophe. So the narrative mode of apocalypse is very present from the far north in particular and for the human future in general. We are, if you pay attention to the climate news, constantly given narratives of rupture. Being trained as a historian makes it hard for me to see such stories as neutral. They shape the border of our minds and of our politics. So I spent much of the afternoon of that trip on Inchukotka wondering, what is the attraction of these narratives of absolute end? And what meaning slinks in with a proclamation of apocalypse? What I want to do this afternoon is take you with me on that trip and through the pasts that we encountered, from Chukchi theories of history to Bolshevik aspirations for the future. Both speak to what apocalyptic narratives, the allure of ending worlds and what they foreclose, and to the experience of surviving actual worlds ending. It is a historical exploration, but one that is also a bit obsessed, as I am, with thinking about what the tools and modes of history can offer to the present. One of the dead in whose company I have passed quite some time is this man named Karl Janovich Lux. He was dark haired and handsome, and when he wrote the following from Chukotka um, to Moscow in the 1920s, he was in his late 30s. The Chukchi, he wrote, are the majority of the native population of the Chukchi Peninsula. Under the Tsars, these natives were only of interest as suppliers of furs. Nobody gave thought to protecting the base of the native economy to improving his way of life. As a result, the fur trade was nearly extinguished and reindeer husbandry fell off catastrophically. To fix this destruction is our task. In Karl's life is a history of apocalyptic allure. He was born on the western edge of the Russian Empire in 1888 to peasants who were so destitute that his father nearly sold him as an infant to the childless baron who owned the lands that his parents worked. As a boy, he tended cattle. Around him, most people were confined to agricultural toil on old noble estates or to industrial toil in new factories. His parents were unable to afford education beyond basic literacy so Carl became a deckhand when he was barely more than a child. His voyages took him to Baltic ports thrumming with discontent. Strikers protested factories that rent their bodies. Bread lines turned into riots after days of hunger. Students demanded representative government. Tsar Nicholas II, heir to four centuries of autocratic rule, sheltered in his palaces, spent lavishly, and hired more police. The people that Karl met outside those aristocratic walls found their present so unjust, so sickly, and so impossible that their question was not would it end, but when and how. Karl heard Baptists preaching hellfire, Orthodox priests invoking salvation of saints, 
and a dozen other sects calling down the final judgment. These visions all shared a plot. First, the apocalypse, then a reign of harmony and perfection. It is a very old story, passed from the Middle East to Europe, from Jewish cosmologies into Christian traditions, going back almost 3,000 years to the prophecies of Zoroaster, who foretold a cataclysmic battle between light and dark. The triumph of light would give the righteous a new life, one without suffering or toil. Cycles of birth and death would end, and the world would emerge linear and immortal. But Carl did not become a Baptist or start worshiping saints. He joined a socialist reading circle. In the telling of Yuri Slutskin, who is a particularly masterful reader of the Russian socialist condition, the plot Carl learned also came from Zoroaster's lineage. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels foretold how the darkness of capitalist exploitation would become the light of communist utopia. Between these poles was a kind of earthly revelation, what socialists called revolution, a word that Sloskin reminds us promised the end of the old world and the beginning of a new just one. I first met Karl in an age-crumpled file in Vladivostok where I learned what he would give for that new world. At 17, he was arrested for distributing illegal pamphlets. For the next decade, he was in and out of custody. He left a four-year term at Orel Central Penitentiary with tuberculosis. And in his autobiography, he described being bound by a guard where the ropes ate into my body to the bones at the hands and feet so that it was impossible for me to control them. When Vladimir Lenin brought the Russian Revolution into the bitterly cold and hunger-filled winter of 1917, Karl was in Siberian exile. He joined Lenin's army when it reached the north and then moved to Chukotka. He was tasked by the new Soviet government with, quote, liquidating the consequences of centuries-old injustices from the tundra. So when Karl wrote, to fix this destruction is our task, part of what he meant was, we shall end the unjust world, and beyond it is a life without want. I find much to admire in the purity of this vision. Carl went to prison and into exile to help found the kingdom of freedom on earth. One appeal of the apocalypse, thus, is that it can make those on its threshold feel world historically important. But what is this place called Chukotka that Carl went to save? Perhaps first and foremost, Chukotka is reindeer country, and it has been at least since the end of the last ice age. Reindeer are almost never alone, and they're almost never still. They move constantly to find fresh pasture, and in the summer to find the breezes that keep mosquitoes from tormenting their flesh. As I've learned from some time spent in their company, they make a gently percussive sound as they walk as a tendon in their hooves snaps over the sesamoid bone. So a herd like this one, you can hear it coming in the distance like old drums. Chukotka is also Chukchi country. It has been, in Chukchi history, back into deep time. In that far-reaching past, reindeer have always been important. But they are also animals that Chukchi history explains as having a dynamic relationship with people. Several centuries before the first Russian speaker arrived, the Chukchi and wild reindeer struck a bargain in the relationship that we call domestication. Reindeer who lived as familiars with people were protected from wolves and bears. People who lived as familiars with reindeer were protected from starvation. In the history that the Chukchi tell of themselves, a few dozen domesticated reindeer made food or shelter newly dependable. A herd of hundreds or thousands made politics newly potent, as the bodies of many reindeer carried the authority of gifts and made it possible to feed armies for war. In the early 1700s, the Chukchi, in fact, fought and won battles against the Russian Empire, expelling them to the borders where they were reduced to traitors rather than imperial overlords. 
Yet, to walk out with a reindeer herd on a tundra morning was to enter a world where human authority did not extend fully even to the tame animals snuffling outside Chukchi tents. Chukotka's hills were home to many beings, to mushroom-shaped men and giants with gaping mouths and wild reindeer people, any of whom could steal a herd. Some of these beings were kin and some were foes. The valleys, the rivers, the reindeer, the foxes and the walruses, all bore souls that required entreaty. To live in Chukotka required frank supplication and acknowledgement of the human dependence on beings other than themselves. That is, social life was made up of persons, not all of whom were human. Many of them were reindeer. And Chukchi theories of history took from this a sense that the past both contained linear aspects, the domestication of reindeer, for example, but was caught to in patterns of time that spooled out through the land in cycles. This long-standing Chukchi observation of time in the Arctic also matches with a scientific work on northern climate and species, particularly the reindeer. Since the last ice age, the Arctic has seen periodic cyclical changes in the climate, so that roughly each 50 to 100 years comes a spate of slightly warmer years usually by a quarter to a half a degree Celsius. For reindeer, this slight warming led to intertwined perils. Cold air reduces the quantity of precipitation, so in warmer winters, there's far more snow on the ground, which founders reindeer herds and makes it much more difficult for them to move and graze. In warm years, snow also tends to fall um, in drifts then get a layer of rain or melting on top of it, which freezes into an icy crust that prevents reindeer from paw th pawing through it for lichens or dried grasses. Boggy summers infected their hooves, hindered migration, and left herds valuable to anthrax. As a result, reindeer in the Arctic are never a static species in terms of number. They're always growing or in the kind of near term ready to decline. For Chukchi, the way that the Arctic climate worked through reindeer in, had direct influence on life and politics. A family with 5,000 reindeer could, in the course of two or five or 10 years, find themselves with only hundreds or maybe even dozens, enough for food, but certainly not for armies. There were, therefore, no hereditary leaders or particularly fixed hierarchies. Such things were laughable, as the Chukchi explained to anthropologists in the late 19th century. To walk out on an Arctic morning was always an appeal to a will-filled universe. As one Chukchi man told it not long before Carl Lux was born, nothing created by man has any power. Carl, either Lux or Marx, would not have agreed. Freedom, as Frederick Engels wrote, consists in the control over ourselves and over external nature. Liberation came from bending every resource to human need, and only humans could be free. This was the fundamental plot for Marx and Engels, and the plot that Lenin picked up, the capacity for progress that drew societies from hunting and gathering to agriculture to industrial capitalism and onward to the revolution, beyond which there would be no suffering or decay. The idea of time that Karl Lux brought with him to Chukotka was aggressively linear. On the tundra, Carl's job was to identify external nature to control. Chukotka was rapidly deemed too cold for agriculture and too distant and rugged for much industry. But there were the reindeer with useful meat, and there were foxes with valuable pelts, and there were people that, in the Bolshevik view of people like Carl, needed saving from the boot hill of natural caprice. Thus. Young missionaries of the new culture and the new Soviet state, as one Bolshevik put it, came north to teach the Chukchi about Lenin, leading to scenes like this one with the young teacher um, teaching behind a portrait of Lenin on the wall, and also this engraving which shows Lenin hanging out on a stuffed seal poke, um, not something that ever happened in practice, um, but several of these images carved onto walrus ivory made their way out of Chukotka in the 1930s and 40s. 
Other Bolsheviks were put to work designing new methods for reindeer breeding and corralling and pasturing and systems for making fox pens and barns. The goal was to eradicate the flux in reindeer and fox numbers. For reindeer's numbers went up and down every 50 to 100 years, foxes' populations tended to cycle every two to three, dependent on cycles of lemmings. The goal of the socialist farms was to replace such inconsistency with predictable growth. It also would serve to transform human life. Caged foxes required no long days setting traps on the, among the thickets that foxes prowled so that the Chukchi could live in town in apartments with electricity and running water, while their children, Carl wrote, could attend a first-class school not in native dialect for a real Soviet education. Carl did not ask the Chukchi if they wanted this new world, and no one else did either. And nobody asked the foxes about the pens or the reindeer about their corrals. To do so was unthinkable. Another appeal of the apocalypse is that proclaiming it is not an act of supplication, but of certainty. In Chukotka, such certainty could be a kind of madness. But Carl Lux did not live to see most of it. In 1932, he took an accidental bullet while surveying foxes and reindeer and other life on the Chown River in Chukotka's northwest. As he bled to death, so the Soviet reports go, he begged his fellow revolutionaries to continue their work in, quote, the most remote places inhabited by natives, no matter the victims and in spite of any cost. As we traveled north toward Amguema on that afternoon in 2018, Alex told me how many of the victims who came after Carl were Chukchi. We did not want to live in the way that the Soviets said was correct, Alex explained. All around us as we drove were the ruins of Carl's world, the apartment buildings and other structures built into the land to settle it, electrify it, and make it possible to be educated in Russian. These things did not signal the promised land to Alex's ancestors as they did for Carl. The Chukchi did not want to give their reindeer to Soviet collective farms or take day-long shifts in dark fox barns, and they certainly didn't want to give over their visions of creation, the raven that made their land long ago, or the boy who was born from a reindeer ear, for the stories that Bolsheviks told. As we bounced north toward the Amvam River, I thought about the Bolshevik teacher whose memoir I had read. He just remembered pointing to a portrait of Lenin in a tent on the Chukchi coast and explaining how he that we see hanging on the wall taught that all people will live well only when they themselves make their own lives. The Chukchi elder he was speaking with responded, what you say is nonsense. Doesn't Lenin know that we make our own lives ourselves? After all, the Chukchi, who had begun domesticating reindeer hundreds of years before the Soviets arrived, knew the power of their animals. They knew that reindeer allowed them autonomy to amass wealth in the form of herds, and were skeptical of the Soviet claims that their lives would be better if they turned their herds over to the state. This difference in opinion about what a reindeer should do and who they were for led in the two decades after Carl's death to violence across the tundra. In places, the Chukchi killed their reindeer and sometimes even killed themselves rather than be part of the new promised land. Sometimes there were open small wars, histories of violence that run across Chukchi's, the Chukchi landscape, although it is essentially invisible now, but still remains in the stories that are right under the surface of any conversation. Around and after this violence, by the 1950s and 60s, Soviet scientists began mapping the tundra, looking for tundra plants to study their ra rational methods of use, began vaccinating reindeer, dusting them with DDT, and deliberately breeding them for size and temperament. The Soviet archives are dense with studies on the use of reindeer milk, reindeer sinew, and reindeer hides, even reindeer hair, which was used to stuff life preservers. Reindeer herding was increasingly mechanized, given over not to the labor of draft reindeer, but to fossil fuels where possible. Wolves were hunted from helicopters and poisoned by the hundreds. The purpose of these interventions was the creation of a more 
of more reindeer, since more reindeer were the sign of the arrival of Coral Lux's dream, a linear history on the tundra as evidenced by ever increasing productivity, rising in a straight line. On that tundra, the Chukchi were still regular, in regular relationship with reindeer, but husbandry by the 60s and 70s required formal education, a degree at least at the high school level in reindeer care, and that education was found in town. This transformed people's family lives as herders who were in the new regime, usually men, were sent out from their apartment blocks by helicopter to take week or month long shifts on the tundra while their wives and children remained in town. The women usually working in fox barns um, and their children going to school. Reindeer work had become as close to factory work as it's possible to do with a migratory species. And like Soviet factory work anywhere, there were problems. Tractors took years to arrive, people drank too much and read too little, but the correct socialist form was in place, a way of organizing reindeer according to the rules of good Marxist-Leninist collectivism and for the good of the Soviet Union. The result of this was supposed to be larger herds. One reindeer scientist even went so far as to argue that the revolution had brought such new forms of organizing the reindeer herd that the growth would be infinite. It was the ultimate linear dream of progress completely unending, an escape from the limits of moss and lichen and from the necessity of relating to other life. It is an irony at the heart of the Marxist project, or at least the Soviet variant of it, that in the attempt to free human beings from exploitation, all other life became a mere resource. Something else about the apocalypse is that its battles only damn or save human beings. In this story, our species has no kin but ourselves. We reached the Omvam River by midday. A quarter mile or so from its banks is the village of Amguema. It's a Soviet town, concrete buildings connected by elevated gas pipes shedding insulation. Entropy has taken over the outskirts, pulling down houses, filling the space between with fireweed. But in the center, there were curtains in the open windows and bright new paint on the concrete. We stopped to speak with a group of men in rubber boots. One of them introduced himself as the mayor. They were digging a drainage ditch, he explained, because the tundra under the town was seeping. Alex asked if the reindeer brigades were close. The mayor pointed us west toward the river. If they have returned, he said, their yaranga, their reindeer hide tents, will be there. And he advised that we walk, not take the car. Since the fall, he said, the roads have decayed. In Chukotka, when people say the fall, what they mean is the Soviet Union ceasing to exist. By the early 1990s, socialist efforts to control this land had transformed many things, built the roads and the apartments, brought children into schools, herded reindeers with helicopters. And so Chukotka in some ways had become the Soviet version of the world that we now find normal, where lights came on with a switch and ships brought goods from far away. But the Soviet Union never did mold time into linear form. Even before the USSR sundered, reindeer herds defied Soviet prophecies and began to decline due to a series of warm years. Foxes kept dying from rabies and distemper, so that Carl's most apocalyptic promise, the freedom from any natural constraint, proved impossible. And then what did change disappeared. In my profession, the question of the Soviet collapse is often one of why. Was it the economy, the politics, the ideology? But in Chukotka, stories about the 1990s bend toward the how. How did we survive a civilization in its ending? All that the Soviets had brought with them the gas heat and the machinery and the medicines was no more. Alex was a child when the electricity stuttered off. There was no gasoline to move supplies, but then there were no supplies to really move anyway. For the better part of a decade, the region experienced a kind of crash decarbonization, the withdrawal of nearly all fossil fueled power. And it is not an argument or a model for how to decarbonize. 
Older people died without medicine or warmth. Mothers worried that lack of food meant little milk for their infants, and everyone was cold. The horizon of time closed. What would the summer bring to keep families fed and whole during the winter, and then what would the winter bring? The fox barns emptied, and untended reindeer went feral or were lost to the packs of wolves. Yet each day came with its small, specific tasks of survival. Chukchi families set up yoranga inside their apartments for warmth and burned seal oil lamps for light. Through summer and fall, people picked berries and greens and packed them in seal fat and reindeer tallow for the winter. It was good to know hunters who lived along the coast in the villages where the elders still remembered how to kill bowhead whales without specialized equipment. It was also good to know how to tend reindeer without helicopters, how to sew reindeer hide clothes, or harness a reindeer when the snow machines ran out of gas. Much of what kept people alive were small things, things that are easily or at least often overlooked by some historians as mere chores, the work of caring. Solidarity, that old socialist refrain, ceased to be a slogan and became a necessity. At the end of a world, there are no damned and saved souls, only people and other kin to share in the work of making life possible. No one knew it would happen, Alex told me. We couldn't just hope it would end. The trick to surviving was in knowing something about the land and the animals and in just keeping on without any certainty at all. When we finally arrived to the banks along the Omvam River, the reindeer were still out at pasture. There were none to be seen as we picked our way over the uneven ground with our parcels of bread and biscuits. On the bank, among low willows, were two yoranga, round and white like landed clouds. Alex called out hellos, and from within one of the tents, a voice asked if we wanted tea. When I stooped into the Yoranga, I was blinded for a moment by the smoke, which came from a small fire in the middle, its coals sheltering a blackened pot. Nearby sat an older man and woman who introduced themselves as Grigori and Anna. We gave them our names and our family's names and sat cross-legged on reindeer skins, passing our gifts in exchange for the tea. The conversation then looped between Russian and Chukchi, so I did not understand all of it but there were relatives to discuss and news from wider Russia to pass on, what Putin was doing in Moscow, what the market in China was for reindeer horns. I caught that Grigori and Anna were born just after the Chukchi and Soviets ceased killing each other and were nearly grandparents by the time of the collapse. Their sons work in Amguema part of the year, but were out at the time with the reindeer herds. They sell some of the meat in Chukotka's larger towns and keep the rest and export the reindeer antlers. The tundra where the reindeer graze has grown strange, Grigori explained to us. There are new insects, beetles that the Chukchi have no words for, and which eat some of the same plants as the reindeer. Anna was worried about chemicals and cancer. From what the Soviet left behind in their many military ex, um, buildings, but also from the garbage that she said washed up on the Bering Sea coast every storm. What does it leach into the fish that we eat all year from this river, she asked. And then there was the weather. Deep snow, rains that came late in the fall for the past few years. We all looked down at our tea. No one knows what's going to happen, Grigori said. It's probably a good idea to buy more rubber boots. On that afternoon along the Omvam, I was almost the same age as Carl looks when he wrote, to fix this destruction is our task. And we had other things in common. I also came of age, or I am of age, in a world that seems too precarious and unjust to continue. People with power spend lavishly and hire more police. In the United States, our national politics leads less to the poor selling their children to the wealthy than the wealthy stealing their children's futures, carbon atom by carbon atom. And all around us are whispers of the end. We live in late capitalism, people say, implying an imminent sundown. We live in the sixth extinction, people say, calling up the void with a phrase. We live in a climate emergency, a crisis, a thing terribly more than change. 
The grimmest of these prophecies tells an old story of the ultimate battle in which an unlivable climate will drive out the darkness that humans have become, as if the end to human failing is our extinction. To me, the core of this kind of apocalyptic thinking is nihilism, a sense that this world is too despoiled to continue. The seduction of such stories is in how certain they make the teller feel. An apocalyptic narrative is like looking at a horizon with no clouds or hills. The way forward seems terribly assured. To walk it, there's no need to mind the lives of others who are rendered invisible by the power of imagining that they're already gone. Apocalyptic prophecy is also an escape from contemplating, from seeing in the here and now how life goes on even through the catastrophe. The Chukotkan Riverbank in Amguema has borne two world endings in the past century, the end of the world without socialists and the end of the world with them. The story of these endings, the story that these endings have etched into the earth bears no relation to Zoroaster's final battle or the pure cleansing fire of Karl's revolution. What the land here speaks instead is a tale in which the ruptures are never complete. No revolution, after all, exercises the quotidian, the need to rise and sleep, to nourish and shelter, to care for new birth and imminent deaths. This is the insurmountable stuff of being. In the company of Chukotka's dead and living, I have come to believe that the most terrifying thing about our future is not just what will change or cease or grow uncanny, but what must continue on regardless. And all of this was vi visible on the drive to Amguema. Almost 100 kilometers, the road is marked by sequential clots of Soviet debris, rusted things, broken things, and shelters left open to the sky. One way to see this landscape in Chukotka is as unrelentingly scarred, a place completely befouled, an earth that is beyond saving. Another is as a site of ongoing restitution, the mare down in the mud, making another year livable for his town, the reindeer rib that fed us in Grigori and Anna's tent, the fox raising a new generation inside a lidless, rusted oil barrel. One thing that Chukotka makes clear is how we all live in the company of the dead, and that we are all ourselves future deaths, which brings a question, what presence will we be for the lives that come after us? To fix destruction is our task, but what if that mandate summoned not delusions of escape or human grandeur, but repair? It's not an easy task. It will take, I think, all of what I find inspiring about Karl Lux, how he worked hard and collectively, how he believed that justice was possible and equality was critical. Our uneasy world needs both his courage and his bodily sacrifice. But Chukotka's history also carries other lessons. It asks that we, particularly those of us so privileged as to be imagining the end of a world for the first time, trade the temptation of apocalyptic escapism for a kind of world historical humility. It asks for perseverance without certainty, for prophecies that hold space for more than people. And perhaps most of all, Chukotka is a lesson in how restoring what is, has broken is a reminder to be careful with what is here and now. It is an entreaty to make things last, to create better ruins, and to care for what will outlast our small and tender lives. Thank you. We have about 10 minutes um, for questions. Um, before that, though, I just want to remind people that this is not the last session of the day. We'll be taking a break at 5 p.m., um, but do come back here virtually or otherwise um, at 7, which will be a presentation with our keynote speaker, Linda Hogan, um, who will be in conversation with my wonderful thesis student, um, Olivia Malwazetsky. Um, so do tune in for that. There will be refreshments outside starting at 6.30. And I'm now happy to take any questions. There's a mic in the room, um, if folks here have them, and someone is manning the, um, the online <laughs> chat.
thank you, Bachiba, for such a um, gorgeous and also devastating um, reflection. Uh, I guess I have a question about the irony that you named uh, at the heart of the Marxist project, or what you then qualified as the Soviet version of the Marxist project. So I'm not a historian, and um, uh, I, but I do know that, that recently there have been returns to uh, moments in Marx where um, uh, he writes about metabolic rift and mm -hmm. where he writes about, uh, I mean, where he writes with a real knowledge of, um, extra of, of how certain intense, intensive and extractive forms of um, agriculture would disrupt natural uh, cycles of, of nutrients and, and life. Um, and so the ultimate irony then does seem to be that the, that there was knowledge within that project that should mm -hmm. have saved it from having this kind of um, effect. So I don't know the rest of the story as in, is there, uh, are those moments in Marx, um, moment, I mean, moments that would have been read by those who were, uh, who, those who were, you know, trying to realize the, the, the project? Um, uh, are they moments that were ignored or are they, or are they things that were, that people believed they, they were respecting. Uh, so I guess, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I'd just love to uh, learn more about what the, the mechanics of that irony, that historical irony. Yeah, yeah it's a great question, thank you. Um, I mean, in, as a very broad generalization, the, the pieces of Marx that I think are the most um, useful and um, kind of capacious in terms of thinking about the, the environment more generally were not the major um, influence, particularly when it's kind of Marxism is rearticulated by Lenin and then by Stalin. It's m kind of much more of a Promethean Marxism that sees heavy industrialization as the, um, the path forward. But by the, the 1960s and the 1970s, there are um, active, if kind of ideologically careful, um, ecological movements within the Soviet Union, some of which are looking at um, the pieces of Kapital and other writings by Marx that talk about this idea of the metabolic rift and are, are kind of trying to think more ecologically. Um, but kind of m m much as thinkers today who try to kind of work within capitalism to try to wrestle it into a form that's perhaps less um, completely interested in maximal extraction, um, the kind of priorities of the government um, and the, the ideological drive was kind of remained set at this, you know, at a view essentially that the, the world that is not people is for people to transform. Um, and that seemed to be the piece that was really the most inspirational for the, the kind of high level decision makers. And part of that, I think, um, in fairness to Marx and in fairness to the people who were really working to interpret Marxism very carefully within the Soviet Union, this is done within the context of competition with the global capitalist world. Um, and the sense that, you know, you couldn't actually relax the, uh, you know, foot on the gas pedal <laughs> in terms of things like production because then you would simply lose the capacity to have a revolution at all. Um, and certainly by the you know, 70s and 80s, the necessity of trying to compete with the West in terms of providing a consumer society for Soviet citizens um, really overrode kind of any interpretation of Marxism that would have led in a different direction. Um. Thanks. Um, I, I knew you were a great historian and an interesting person, but I didn't realize you were a beautiful writer. Thank you. There's a lot of art in what you just shared with us. But I, I'm just curious about your use of the word linear. Um, I think about linear versus circular a lot in terms of, um, and when you're talking about, like, what are some of your thoughts about your use of that word? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Also, um, I think so. This this talk came out of um, a larger project that kind of looks at the ways in which um, the the Soviet attempt to make the um, the eastern side of the Bering Strait, or sorry, the western side. It's I find this very confusing because it depends from where you're looking. <laughs> um, the side that's now in Russia part of a sort of socialist world and the American attempt to make the side that's 
in the United States, part of a you know American style democratic capitalist world. Um, and one of the things that I noticed in the ways in which both the United States and the Soviet Union went about colonizing um, and extracting resources from, from Beringia is the kind of consistent emphasis on time as relentlessly going forward. This is, I mean, it's so explicit in many Soviet texts that it, it almost goes unsaid in some Soviet histories. I mean, the major cultural um, artifacts called things like time forward exclamation point, right? Like this is, a, a huge obsession on the part of the Soviet Union. But putting that obsession next to what's happening in the United States makes it quite clear that the same thing is actually happening um, with kind of fewer exclamation points um, in the capitalist mindset, which is history goes one way, it goes forward, it never looks backwards really. Um, it certainly doesn't go backwards, right? There's, there's not a capacity for time to do anything other than proceed in one direction. And as it proceeds, it's supposed to, everything is supposed to get better. Right, it's, it's not just linear, it's a kind of progressive linearity. Um, and I think that that's a, you know, it's a founding assumption that appears in kind of Soviet understandings that production will always go up. And this is how you get ideas that you can have an infinite quantity of reindeer growth, which you don't have to think about for very long to understand that that probably can't happen, right? There's like only so much ground for the reindeer to be on. You can't grow that infinitely. And yet, right, you can publish a paper in the Soviet Union that says, you know, we will increase reindeer production into infinity. And at the same time, it is the measure of a healthy capitalist economy that it's growing, right? We don't have a way of kind of marking our society's um, kind of historical trajectory without growth being kind of the fundamental unit. Um, and any kind of movement away from that is seen as a, a signal of real um, ill health. Um, which I think has kind of a similar linearity built into it. And it was strikingly in contrast to the ways that the Chukchi and other indigenous folks around the Bering Strait understand um, the kind of times that they lived in, which certainly had, you know, things that look linear, that have a before and after, things like there used to not be domestic reindeer and now we have domestic reindeer, and that was a process and we can talk about the history of it but also that the reindeer themselves are animals that have this kind of cyclical logic to them. So, you know, at, at some point you can't actually impose something linear upon that. And it's that last piece that the, the Soviet Union just kind of never grasped onto, right? They really wanted the reindeer to be linear and the reindeer really didn't care that they wanted <laughs> that outcome. Um, so I think that's um, kind of in brief where my thinking on the, the kind of relentlessness of time comes from. We have one from the chat. Uh, so it says, I was struck by the connections between the natural and technology and the ways humans adapt the, the one with the other. I sense something hopeful here and yet wonder if you feel there's knowledge or practice we could create and sustain to amplify this hope to make it manifest. Thank you for taking us on this amazing journey. Thank you, that's a, um, that's a lovely observation. Um, I struggle as somebody, I think, who is optimistic by disposition and pessimistic by profession <laughs> with how to balance those two things. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that the note of hope existed there. Um, I think part of what I have found helpful in, in thinking with this part of the world and, and the folks who live there and have long experience of it is, um, kind of a, a decatastrophizing, if that's not a very nice word, um, of the present moment that we're in, right? Not, not to downplay, because certainly if you live in the Arctic or subarctic, you can't downplay things like climate change because the effects actually are significantly more acute um, in the north, which is warming about twice as fast as the um, temperate zones. But to not lose track within that sense of, you know, things being amiss that there are also still kind of duties and practices that carry on regardless. Um, and that it is kind of a return and a focus and a kind of continue, continuation of those practices of community making. And I mean that very capaciously, community between people, but community kind of across um, the barrier of being human or not, that are actually critical to, to anything working coming forward. And I do find that hopeful. Um, I don't know how well it scales, and I think that at scale it looks very different in different places because 
how you live in the environment in Chukotka is not identical to how you live in an environment in Rhode Island. Um, but perhaps it's actually that observation, rather than looking for a universal, that to me is one of the most, um, the, one of the messages from this history that kind of keeps emerging to me, um, that things just don't work um, on the Chukchi Peninsula as they do in Moscow over and over and over again, and that Moscow's inability to kind of grapple with the fact that the rules of history as they saw it were not exportable was a big part of the problem. Um, and so it has made me think, I think, harder about what it means to actually not scale up <laughs> our solutions, but scale them to the places that we live in um, and the, the beings that we live in within those spaces. I think we are exactly at time. That's quite amazing. Um, thank you all for spending part of your this really sunny, beautiful afternoon indoors, which um, is not an easy choice. So I appreciate it. Thank you.